on this episode of Peak. What's in a name? The real people behind scientific units of measure. Part 1. Fahrenheit, volts, decibels. We use these terms all the time. They are scientific units of measure, denoting the levels of things such as temperature, electric potential, intensity of sound. They are also eponyms. Eponyms are words derived from the name of a person or place. Behind each one of these scientific units is the story of a man or woman whose contribution to their scientific field is celebrated every time something is measured. Proof that the lives of men are short, but their contributions to science and society can live forever. We don't have enough time to talk about all of these interesting accomplished people, maybe someday, but we can cover a few. Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit Scientific Unit Degrees Fahrenheit Measures Temperature Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit was born in 1686 in Gdansk, Poland. His father was a wealthy German merchant who intended for Daniel, the eldest of five siblings, to go to university and study medicine. Daniel was a gifted student with a passion for science, and medicine was a natural choice. But those plans changed when both of his parents died from eating poisonous mushrooms. Daniel and his siblings were at the mercy of their state-appointed guardians, who decided that 15-year-old Daniel should follow in his father's footsteps. He was apprenticed to a prominent Dutch merchant and shipped off to Amsterdam. Unfortunately, Fahrenheit didn't have the same zeal for bookkeeping that he did for science, and he proved a challenge for his Dutch master. However, it was during this apprenticeship that young Fahrenheit encountered Florentine thermometers, a highly sought-after item. Thirty years earlier, a private group of scientists in Florence, many of whom were former students of Galileo, and who were sponsored by Ferdinando de' Medici, created a series of thermometers. Composed of sealed glass tubing with a stem and bulb, and partly filled with alcohol, these thermometers were not affected by air pressure, as previous temperature sensors had been. Fahrenheit was fascinated. By the last year of his apprenticeship, Fahrenheit had found his calling not as a merchant, but as an amateur meteorologist. He left the mercantile and learned to blow glass, making his own capillaries. His mission was to create a reliable thermometer that was easy to make and calibrate. At first, he filled his glass tubing with wine spirits, like his predecessors. But later he had a breakthrough with mercury, then referred to as quicksilver, which expands and contracts more evenly than alcohol. Inspired by Danish astronomer Ole Romer, Fahrenheit also set out to create his own temperature scale with three fixed calibration points, freezing brine, freezing water, and blood heat, otherwise known as body temperature. Sensing that he was onto something, Fahrenheit began producing his mercury thermometers in his workshop in The Hague. And boy, did those things blow up. Not literally, I mean, they were really popular. Everybody wanted one. In 1718, he was giving lectures on chemistry in Amsterdam, and by 1724, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in England. Those things were super hot. Daniel Fahrenheit enjoyed the fruits of his labors for another 12 years, until he died suddenly in 1736, ironically from a fever. Anders Celsius Scientific Unit Degrees Celsius Measures temperature. Anders Celsius at science in his blood. Born into a Swedish family of mathematicians and astronomers, it's no surprise that he had a talent for math and a desire for an academic life. He attended the University of Uppsala and made such an impression that the university offered him a professorship in astronomy less than 10 years later. In those days, meteorology and geographical measurement fell under the umbrella of astronomy. Celsius's earliest research involved the study of auroral phenomena. Celsius was the first person to realize the connection between the aurora borealis and changes in the Earth's magnetic field. 
With his assistant, Olaf Hjorder, he observed the movements of a compass needle, noting that large deviations of the needle occurred when auroral activity was the strongest. In 1736, Celsius embarked on an expedition sponsored by the French Academy of Sciences and led by French mathematician and astronomer Pierre-Louis Maupertuis. The purpose of the mission, dubbed the Lapland Expedition, was to visit Tornio in northern Finland and measure a degree along the meridian. The French Academy had dispatched another team to the southern hemisphere, to a meridian in what is now Ecuador. Measurements taken by both crews confirmed Newton's belief that the Earth's shape is an ellipsoid that is flattened at the poles. The successful Lapland expedition made Celsius a science rock star, and he used his notoriety to raise funds to build his own observatory in Uppsala. There he observed a variety of astronomical objects, and even devised a way to measure the magnitude, or level of brightness, of stars. Celsius cataloged the magnitude of over 300 stars using his photometric system. He viewed each star through a collection of identical transparent glass plates. The more plates required to extinguish the light, the greater the magnitude. Celsius needed 25 glass plates to extinguish the light of Sirius, the brightest star in Earth's night sky. Seen here. Alas, the story of how Celsius became a household name is much less romantic. During his expeditions, Celsius performed and recorded a number of careful temperature and atmospheric pressure experiments, aiming to establish an international temperature scale grounded in science. His scale set a value of 100 degrees for the freezing point of water and 0 degrees for the boiling point. Wait, huh? 100 degrees for freezing? It wasn't until 1745 that the scale was flipped by Carl Linnaeus for more practical measurements. Celsius dubbed his new scale centigrade, Latin for 100 steps. Interestingly, degrees Celsius isn't exactly the same thing as degrees centigrade. The Celsius scale is a centigrade scale, but with a measurement set at 0 0.01 degree that designates the triple point of water the point at which water exists simultaneously as a gas, liquid, and solid. The General Conference of Weights and Measures, sounds like a kick-ass party, established this definition in 1950 as a more precise measure, and Celsius replaced centigrade. Andrew Celsius may have agreed with the General Conference's decision if he hadn't died of tuberculosis 206 years prior to their announcement. He was just 42 years old. Only the good die young. Alessandro Volta Scientific unit, the volt. Measures, electrical potential. Long before the George Clooney of acting took up residence in Como, Italy, it was home to the George Clooney of science, Alessandro Giuseppe Antonio Anastasio Volta. Volta was born into a family with noble lineage, but very little money. He did not speak until the age of four, and his family feared that he was mentally handicapped or hearing impaired. Volta finally learned his native Italian, and making up for lost time, also became fluent in Latin, French, German, and English, all before the age of 18. In his youth, Volta developed a passion for physics and chemistry. His family pressed him to become a lawyer, but Volta refused, and rode off angrily on his Vespa. Hey, he could have had a horse named Vespa. You don't know. In 1774, while a professor of physics at the Royal School in Como, Volta began studying the chemistry of gases. Inspired by a paper about flammable air written by Benjamin Franklin, Volta isolated methane gas. He was the first person to ever do so, and probably the first person to say, what stinks? Soon after, he learned that methane mixed with air exploded when exposed to an electric spark, the foundation of the internal combustion engine. In 1779, Volta joined the faculty at the University of Pavia as a professor of experimental physics. He held this position for the next 40 years and was beloved by his students. That same year, Volta experimented with electrical potential and charge, 
and discovered that for a given object they are proportional. This is now referred to as Volta's Law of Capacitance, and a unit of electrical potential is now called a volt in his honor. Volta's most significant contribution to science and society began as an argument about frog's legs. As Volta was exploring the physics of electricity, another Italian scientist, Luigi Galvani, was studying the effects of electricity on anatomy. Galvani had recently made a remarkable discovery when a spark of static electricity carried by a metal scalpel contacted nerves in the legs of a dead frog and caused them to move. This happy accident revealed that electricity played a part in the movement of animals, an idea that inspired Mary Shelley to write her unforgettable Frankenstein 40 years later. Galvani went public with his discovery, calling it animal electricity and deeming it a special type of electricity only present in living things. Volta disagreed with Galvani, arguing that electricity was electricity, animal or static. He wrangled up some frog's legs and began testing for himself. During this process, he learned that the legs moved when in contact with two different metals. He tossed the frog's legs into the deep fryer and moved on to measuring the electrical effect of different metals when in contact with one another. He determined that the key to producing what we now refer to as voltage was connecting two metals along with a conductive liquid. But thankfully for the frogs, frog juice wasn't necessary. The same result could be achieved by placing the metals, zinc and copper worked best, in diluted acid. Voila! Electric current. He increased the voltage by stacking up more metal pairs and replacing cups of acid with cardboard spacers soaked in salt water. Named the voltaic pile, this curious little device was the first electrochemical cell, otherwise known as a battery. Naturally, the first battery generated a buzz throughout Europe and even the newly independent United States. Volta even impressed Napoleon, who gave him the title of Count. After inventing the voltaic pile, Volta just kept going and going and going, reaching the ripe old age of 82. By the time you've reached the same age, you will have used almost 1,000 batteries. To keep these videos from getting too long, I've split this topic into two parts. To learn about my two favorite people in this bunch, James Watt and Alexander Graham Bell, please check out the video titled What's in a Name Part 2. I promise you won't be disappointed. Thanks for watching Peak! For more information about the subjects of this video, review the information box below. If I piqued your interest, please give me a thumbs up or subscribe to further cure your curiosities.